afternoon, everyone. The microphone is on. And welcome to Seaway uh, Law and to the kickoff event for the Law and Technology Institute, or LTI, as we are now referring to it. So as co-directors of the Institute, Professor Winston and I are really thrilled that so many of you could join us here this afternoon. Um, we're really happy to see so many students, alumni, faculty, um, including many of our um, uh, many of our accomplished adjunct prof professors, uh, members of the Communications Law Institute Alumni Associations, and and of course um, Commissioner Pai. We're thrilled to have all of you here this afternoon. So, as um, many of you probably know, the study of law and technology has a long history and tradition here at CUA Law. So um, the Communications Law Institute, which was our predecessor institute, enjoyed a long uh, three, decade, uh, three decades of success in preparing students for the study of communications law and the practice of communications law. And um, some of you may not be as familiar with um, our history with respect to intellectual property, but it's uh, similarly long and rich. So, uh, in fact, our founding dean, um, William C. Robinson, was a leading uh, patent scholar, and uh, he wrote uh, the, uh, the leading patent treatise of his time. So he was um, the Chisholm of his time, which means something to the patent folks in the room, um, but maybe not to the rest of you. So, Professor Winston and I are both just so excited to have this opportunity to bring together these two areas of the law and um, to work with this new institute and to work with all of you in, in this room. Um, so I want to again thank you for being here today and um, I'm going to keep my remarks short because you didn't come here to hear from me. So I am now going to turn the podium over to Christopher Mills. Uh, Chris is uh, currently a third year student here at the law school. Um, Chris is the president of the Communications Law Student Association, and he uh, also uh, recently, last spring, uh, was a law clerk in Commissioner Pai's office and was instrumental in um, uh, getting Commissioner Pai here for us today. So thank you, Chris. And um, please, Chris is going to in introduce Commissioner Pai for us. Thank you, Professor LaBelle. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Mills. I'm the president of the Communication Law Students Association and a proud member of the university's Law and Technology Institute. I'm pleased to be here with you this afternoon and have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Commissioner Pai. Commissioner Pai was nominated to the Federal Communications Commission by President Barack Obama and on May 7, 2012, unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate. Since taking office, Commissioner Pai's focus has been on creating a regulatory environment in which competition and innovation will flourish, thus benefiting the American consumer. Prior to Commissioner Pai's appointment to his current position, he served in the FCC's Office of General Counsel. As a managing partner at General Block, as Associate General, General Counsel at Verizon Communications, and he worked in all three branches of the federal government. Commissioner Pai received his BA from, with honors from Harvard University and his JD from the University of Chicago, where he was an editor of the University of Chicago Law Review. Now, as a devout Bu Buffalo Bills fan, I would be remiss if I didn't mention what always impressed me the most about Commissioner Pai. In addition to Commissioner Pai's stoic opposition to Title II regulation of the internet, in his great efforts towards AM revitalization, Commissioner Pai, an avid Kansas City, Kansas City, or pardon me, Kansas City Chiefs fan, traveled to Anchor Bar in Buffalo, New York, um, the birthplace of the Buffalo Chicken Wing, um, to announce the FCC's decision to do away with the NFL blackout rules. In many regards, in many regards, this makes Commissioner Pai a hometown hero of mine. <laughs> But in all seriousness, I can think of no one better suited or more qualified to discuss entrepreneurship and innovation in America's internet economy. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Commissioner G. Pai. Well, thank you, Krista, for that kind introduction. Uh, Professor Bell, Professor Winston, thanks so much for the invitation. It is great to be here at CUA, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, 
Uh, that is, uh, th th that sentiment is advanced partly out of selfish interest. I've really benefited personally from CUA's uh, excellence over the last couple of years. Chris, as was mentioned, was a law clerk in my office. Allison Nemeth, who is here, was a fantastic law clerk as well as an advisor until recently. And Brendan Carr, who graduated from the law school 10 years ago, which is incredible because he just turned 22, is, <laughs> is here as well. I, I cannot understand how envious I am, frankly, despite the fact that I do maintain some allegiance to Harvard and the University of Chicago, that the fact that CUA has played such a preeminent role in the communications law and regulation space. In fact, I'm hard-pressed to think of any area where uh, an alumni of Catholic or even uh, some of its law students have been studying and writing about these issues haven't influenced the direction of public policy. And I dare say that uh, although CUA has many uh, assets, I, I dare say that this LTI is probably the crown jewel of that. So congratulations on all you've accomplished, and I simply can't wait to see uh, where things go in the future. Uh, this is a great time to be in the area, at the intersection of law and technology. And I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about why I think that is and some of the things that really get me up in the morning and make me want to come to my job. And then I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you'd like at the end. Um, I, I really think uh, that we are on the brink of something big in this country when it comes to entrepreneurship and innovation. It was captured best, although they didn't intend it this way, in the initial trailer for Star Wars, The Force Awakens. I don't know if you happen to see it, but when, uh, when the voice comes over and says, there's been an awakening, have you felt it? And I have felt it, because I've been able to travel this job across the country. So I've been in Reno, Nevada, where I met a man named Gabe Hopper. Gabe's a really talented engineer who cut his teeth at these startups in Silicon Valley and decided, you know what, I just don't like the lifestyle here. I want to be somewhere where you know, it's a smaller town, yet I can still pursue my entrepreneurial dreams. And he's doing that now. He's building a company called Us Time, T-Y-M-E, which is essentially a Skype-type application that lets grandparents and grandkids do everything from read books together to play checkers, even if they have thousands of miles separating them. I've seen that in places like Bozeman, Montana, where I met a guy named Doug Martin, who was a really talented engineer, but just didn't want to leave the big sky country. And so he started this company called Drop Trip, which is essentially a, you know, Uber is applied to shipping. So if you are traveling to LA, you get there and you realize, oh my gosh, I've forgotten something critical. Now instead of having to ship it and FedEx and all the rest of it, you can just go on something where, well, like called Drop Trip, where you know, essentially other users can offer to bring it for you if they happen to be going that way. I've seen it all over the place, including uh, most recently in, uh, in the South, where I met with some companies in Atlanta, Georgia, these are veterans of the industry that have been at the top of the profession in the Valley, in Boston, and other hubs of entrepreneurial activity, but they wanted to set up shop in Atlanta because they have a really good base of engineers from Georgia Tech to work with, and just an environment that's much easier and nicer and frankly cheaper to live in. And it's not just in the technology space where we're seeing this kind of innovation. One of the things I've been impressed with is how technology is enabling innovation completely outside of the realm of technology. And let me just give you a couple of examples. A couple of months ago, I was in a small town called Dillard, Nebraska, population 287. I mean, I'm from a small town in, in Kansas called Parsons, 10,000 people out in the middle of nowhere on a gravel road that uh, is still is lacking for basic internet access. I know rural, but Dillard is really rural. It hardly appears on the map. You've got to, you make Google hit, drill all the way down to the lowest possible uh, you know, denominator in order to find it. But what was amazing was I met a, a couple named Chad and Courtney Lotman. Now, they have a meat processing company in Diller, and you might ask, well, what's the internet connection here? 20 years ago, they had the foresight to create what was then a pretty advanced website, because what they found was people in and around Diller were almost literally dropping carcasses off on their front doorstep saying, well, would you mind processing this meat for us? They didn't have any way to distribute all this meat they were processing. So now they created this website. Uh, fast forward 20 years later, they shipped to all 50 states and abroad, if you've, you've probably had their products at Wholesale, if you've ever had a piece of Epic Jerky from Whole Foods, on the PGA Tour now uses their product. They've hired 40 people in and around Diller, some of whom have moved from Omaha to Diller specifically because of the opportunity. Uh, Chad and Courtney now use all kinds of advanced technologies from cellular to Wi-Fi to monitor all their locations. It's really something that could not have existed but for the internet. Same thing just north in South Dakota. I visited a woman named Chelsea Pickner. Chelsea lived in a really small town in South Dakota, moved to Sioux Falls, and she always had an interest in fashion. And when she graduated from high school and then college, she told her then boyfriend, now husband, you know, I just, I don't see how I'm going to be able to pursue this dream here in Sioux Falls. I'm going to have to move to LA or New York or Chicago. 
And he suggested, well, why don't you create some kind of internet presence? And so she set up a Facebook page, did other sorts of social media to promote her product. And now she, too, is shipping to all 50 states and around the world. She told me that a group of people came in from Hong Kong to Sioux Falls specifically because they found her uh, presence on the web, which is an incredible thing when you think about it. She, too, has created jobs hiring people who are interested in fashion but want to marry the love of fashion to the lifestyle that Sioux Falls supports them. I give you all these vignettes not to simply <laughs> brag about my, uh, my travels throughout all the most exciting <laughs> parts of this country, uh, although that is true, but to just give you a sense of what I think is really unique at this point in time in America, which is this democratization of entrepreneurship. It used to be the case that Silicon Valley would hoard the lion's share of the headlines and certainly the lion's share of the capital, and that might well have been well, uh, you know, reasonable. Uh, in the analog age, when that was a haven for entrepreneurship. But now, virtually anybody in this country with a good idea and a broadband connection can scale their idea and make it world class. And it, literally, the entire world is your customer if you have the ability to access next generation technologies. And what a great thing that is. I mean, I can tell you, as somebody who's grown up in a small town that's on the decline, the young people are leaving, the old people don't see much uh, opportunity for the future. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, these towns are just shriveling up for want of, uh, of opportunity. Broadband is something that can at least staunch the bleeding, or at least give people who are there some hope. You know, the hope that they can be in control of their own destiny. And that's something that I think is tremendous. And as an FCC commissioner, one of the great privileges is that I have the ability to impact that, maybe not directly, but by promoting more broadband deployment. And so, for example, I've rolled out different proposals to increase the amount of broadband we see deployed in areas of this country with less than one person per square mile. I've been able to advocate for more policies and get more fiber into place so that inner city uh, parents can send their kids to school with the knowledge that those kids are going to get a digital education that they otherwise wouldn't get. I've been able to advocate for policies such as wireless infrastructure so that people who live in the Alaskan bush, for example, who literally don't have roads that connect them to outside civilization, can nonetheless get 4G LTE service. That could be the difference between them seeing a doctor in Anchorage and never getting health care whatsoever. Like, those are things that I, it's just such a privilege to be able to play a very small part in this very big issue on. And so uh, that's part of the reason why I just love the commission. Uh, the other thing that I've tried to advocate for, and it's not necessarily strictly within the FCC's bailiwick, but it's uh, sort of a broadening of the government's understanding of what entrepreneurship and innovation is. And not so much as a commissioner, but certainly as a consumer, I've seen recently that a lot of governments, from the federal level to the state level to the local level, and even abroad, have sometimes taken a dim view of this unleashed uh, revolution in innovation. A couple of examples of that, most of which are probably not going to be a surprise to you, are things like Uber. I moved to Washington in 1998, and for those of you who probably don't even remember 1998 because you're so much younger than me, uh, at the time, Washington had this very archaic system where uh, you had to be picked up by a cab in one of several zones. And so those of you who might be old enough to remember, you would get picked up in a zone, there would ensue all kinds of arguments with your cab driver. Which zone did he pick you up in? Did he pick you up on the west side of the street or the east side of the street? Because the fare might be different. How many zones did he traverse to get you to your destination? On top of that, the cab itself was a relatively unpleasant place to, to uh, inhabit for that short period of time. Uh, fast forward to now, I mean, I can just go on my smartphone with UberX, get a, get a cabbie who, not get a cabbie, but get a driver who wants to provide excellent service, who gives me a very clean environment. I don't even have to whip out a credit card now to pay the bill. I mean, what a great, uh, for, for someone who's old like me, that is a tremendous innovation that developed to, uh, delivers incredible consumer value. But the value isn't just on the consumer side. Uh, I took an Uber ride in Charleston, for example, recently, and the woman who drove me told me that she had been laid off from her job, her husband had been in the military and was disabled as a result of injuries sustained in combat in Iraq, and so now both of them are Uber drivers. And much to their surprise, they're earning more than they did before, they have the flexibility to determine when they work. And one of the things she told me, which has really has stuck with me to this day, is that she told me we are finally in charge of our own destiny. We have hope for the future because we can craft our own future. And just multiply that among all the thousands of people who drive for Uber and Lyft and Sidecar and all, the, all these other services. That's tremendous for drivers and for consumers alike. Oftentimes, however, the government is standing in the way, in my view, of that kind of innovation. And so they've erected all these uh, archaic regulations to regulate Uber, for example, as a taxi cab company. 
often and that, that has to be incumbent taxi cab companies. Or they want to uh, impose some archaic uh, labor restrictions, for example, on Uber drivers. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are standing in the way of people who want a service with people who want to provide that service. And as a general matter, I don't think that's the government's role. Same thing with a company like Airbnb. Uh, I have, have endured endless battles with the FCC to stay at somewhere that is uh, hosted by an Airbnb host. Because what I've been told is, well, you, know, you have to stay in a government-approved hotel, even if that hotel is five times the price in an inconvenient area, and so on and so forth. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who've stayed in Airbnb locations and told me, we love this, and it's great to be able to stay somewhere that's an actual home, not a compact box that feels very impersonal. Yet here, too, I've met with uh, some of the folks at Airbnb who have told me that uh, the government is often trying to recast them as you know, the next generation of hotel companies, which imposes which requires the imposition of all kinds of regulations that would prevent them from growing their businesses. Uh, this is not just Uber and Airbnb. I can give you legions of other examples, uh, some of which have nothing necessarily to do with technology, but nonetheless evince this kind of government hesitation to endorse in, in, um, innovation. Uh, beer and spirits, and that's something that I know is close to, to many people's hearts, including my own. And one of the things I found amazing is that uh, I actually love beer now. So when I was a kid, I remember you know, hearing my cores and schlitz and you know, all this terrible swill. Like, you know, why would people pay this money to, to drink this stuff? And now we see all this incredible innovation when it comes to craft beer. Virtually every town you go to has some brewer who decided, you know what, I don't like my day job. I'm going to give it up and start a brewery creating a new product that I think people are going to like. And why do I mention that? Well, because as the owner of the Brooklyn Brewery pointed out in an op-ed in the New York Times recently, there are all these legacy regulations imposed at the behest of the beer distribution industry that prevent them from growing their business, that force them to distribute their product through a very narrow distribution channel that prevent them from innovating and then either prohibit them or tax the heck out of them uh, for building their businesses. And those are the kinds of things I think that government needs to be sensitive to in the digital age. I think that if we take a more forward-looking uh, view of what this entrepreneurship is, what innovation is, what consumer value is, that we're going to refocus these regulations, not so much on making innovative companies check every box, uh, but rather in trying to determine at the bottom line what improves consumer welfare. I mean, it seems to me that is what every regulator, whether you sit at the FCC or your local liquor board, should be focused on. What improves consumer welfare? And I think if the government takes that role, everybody's going to be much better off. Entrepreneurs, obviously, and consumers alike. Uh, with that, I don't have a, a lot of other filibustering that I, uh, <laughs> I want to do, but I do want to just uh, say thank you once again uh, for coming, and uh, I hope to see all of you in our space uh, sometime soon, as I've seen from Chris and Allison, and Brennan, and so many others at CUA. Uh, you have a lot to contribute to this space, and I certainly hope that you do so uh, in the time to come. So congratulations once again on uh, the LTI for, uh, for kicking off, and uh, I really appreciate the invitation. Thanks very much. If anyone would like, questions? if you have any, if you don't, uh... hey, it's Hi, Hi. Uh, I'm Mr. Fai, I'm uh, Muscle Shell, a 3L, and also currently working at the Austin Chair of the SEC. Got it, yes. Uh, and um, thanks so much for your presentation. I uh, thought that you described the, the, the importance, the significance that the connectivity is playing out in our modern economy and our daily lives. And so my, my question is about, you know, there is a there is a movement right now to characterize product and connectivity as an essential feature of, 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 of our daily lives. Do you agree with that characterization? Is that is that is it as essential as other sort of um, you know, services and things that we're maybe accustomed to? Um, and perhaps Tom that is. That's a great question. Uh, and good to see you here. It's nice to see you in the building as well, but uh, we really, really appreciate uh, everything you're contributing to the chairman's office. Um, I, I'm not sure what the perfect adjective is to describe it, but all I can say is that based on what I've seen through my work at the FCC, including traveling around the country and meeting with consumers and entrepreneurs who are affected by our policies, is that broadband is increasingly critical for virtually everything that we do in our lives. I mean, for example, uh, I hate to make uh, the personal uh, professional, but uh, my father is a physician by training, and I still remember when I was a child that he would wake up and drive some night, some mornings before the sun rose, 45 minutes west to a smaller town in southeast Kansas uh, to provide medical care there as a specialist. The next day, he would drive 45 minutes north to another town. And 
you know, I just wonder sometimes if he had started his practice today with a broadband connection, he could do all of that without having to go through all that rigmarole. And in a lot of cases, uh, these are people who uh, might not ever see a specialist because somebody like my dad isn't available. I've been in an Alaska Native village, for example, in Fort Yukon, Alaska, above the Arctic Circle, a town of 60 people with literally no roads. I mean, if you go just out of the town uh, center, uh, you're going to sink into the quicksand of the Alaskan bush during the summer. These are people who've told me that, in some cases, they've never seen a doctor before a wireless connection, a high-speed wireless connection, was put into that town. And just think about what that would mean. I mean, I think a lot of us in the urban areas take that for granted, that, oh, if I get sick, I'll just shelter in the hospital, and you see an ER doctor or whatever. But if you don't have the certainty of that safety net, life is pretty dicey, especially if you're in the Alaskan bush. So for people like that, I think it's increasingly essential. For education, too. It really breaks my heart, to be honest with you, that when I go back to my own hometown, I see that my, uh, my high school, which is a relatively poor high school, uh, doesn't participate in the FCC's e-break program, which exists to provide discounted uh, internet service. And that's something that really connects kids to the next uh, digital opportunities that a lot of other people are, are enjoying. I mean, they've told me that, yes, we'd love to get these uh, your caching servers and all these other things so we can store this content locally and give our kids a shot at succeeding in the internet age, but they simply don't have the wherewithal to do it. And the schools that have provided those opportunities are really seeing their kids' achievement take off. I went to a Chicago uh, magnet school which uh, on the south side of Chicago, which focuses on giving kids who have been written off or had been written off for years a chance to succeed in a completely digital environment. And it's amazing what these kids are doing, everywhere from everything from 3D printing to um, you know, mobile app creation. I mean, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that a digital connection enables. And so, like I said, I don't know what the perfect adjective is, but from my own perspective, my goal is for every American who wants a broadband connection to be able to get one that's affordable, that's fast, that's always getting better, and enables to pursue, them to pursue whatever dream they want. And to me, that's simply the, the, the 21st century version of Section 1 of the Communications Act, which, as you know, uh, promises to, to or tasks the FCC with giving all Americans uh, the access to nationwide rapid communication services at affordable prices. Anybody else? That, sorry, but, hey. Hi, um, my name is Arthi Yaku. I'm a PhD um, student by night, Paddington, or my name. Um, oh. Another uh, question about the internet. Um, I've seen a lot of press about how um, uh, broadband is. Cheaper and faster in other first world countries. I wanted to know um, from your position what your how do you see the U.S.'s broadband deployment? You know, well, that's a very good question, and uh, I often see these same competing stories. And trying to figure out what the facts are uh, is sometimes difficult. But what I have seen is that if you compare apples to apples, the United States really does have the internet economy that's the envy of the world. Now, to be sure, if you're talking about broadband penetration, in a place like rural Wyoming, you're not going to see as many people hooked up as you do in Seoul, South Korea. I mean, in part, that's a function of population density. It's much easier to wire 10 million people who are in a very compact area than it is uh, somewhere the, state, the size of the state of Wyoming. Nonetheless, on a per capita basis, the United States has done remarkably well over the last 15 years. Uh, providers from all the different areas, wireline, cable, there's like telco, cable, wireless, satellite, you name it, have spent over $73 billion building uh, the, the nuts and bolts of our broadband networks. And uh, per capita, what you see is that the investment level is much higher than it is in places like Europe, for example. So on the wireline side, uh, currently we spend something like $562 per household. In Europe, that figure is $244 per household. On the wireless side, we see similarly, basically twice the amount of wireless investment. And when it comes to wireless service itself, 96% of Americans have a choice of three facilities-based providers or more. And in addition, in terms of 4G LTE deployment, we are far, far ahead of where they are. Despite the fact that we have a relatively dispersed population, uh, we have 50% of the world's 4G LTE subscriptions, and almost 90% of Americans have access to 4G LTE. Now, none of these local success statistics is meant to suggest that things are where we want them to be, because God knows I've seen plenty of places where, with gaps, including my own parents' house, where you know, if I'm talking to them uh, over FaceTime and the connection goes dead, I can be re relatively sure that it's on their end and not on my end because I just don't have a reliable broadband provider. So that's why I'm committed, as I said in the response to the earlier question, 
you know, my goal is for there to be ubiquitous broadband that's affordable for everybody who wants it. But I think it's also important to take stock of how far we've come. And in a country with the demographic and geographic challenges that we have, it's pretty impressive to see how far we've come since the commercialization of the internet um, in 1995. I mean, I still remember getting those AOL CDs in the mail that, you know, with this, I can still hear in my mind, you know, I had a sound like, oh my God, I'm just driving crazy. But, uh, but just thinking how far we've gone from that to where, you know, now when my four-year-old son tells me, Daddy, I want to watch television, what he means is, you know, power up the iPad immediately over a high-speed Wi-Fi connection so I can use the mobile app on your iPad to watch, you know, to the Sesame Street app to watch Elmo. I mean, that's, within a generation, our very conception of how these services exist and what they are has changed because of our broadband economy. Sorry, I tend to ramble a lot. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Um, how do you reach your goal That's a really good question. Um, in fact, it's probably the central question we confront on a daily basis because under the Communications Act, which after all the SEC is charged with administering, we don't have the ability to direct investment. We don't get a budget where we say, we are going to spend $1 million building broadband here, nor do we have the power to essentially commandeer the private sector and make them build things. All we can do is try to create a regulatory framework that makes them want to do these things. And that's one of the reasons why, since I came to the commission, and even before I was a commissioner, um, in the Office of General Counsel, I would often see this, that uh, number one, we need to have regulatory parity. Uh, in the old days, uh, it was quite easy for the SEC to do what it did, relatively easier anyway, because we had one set of regulations for telephone companies, one set for cable companies, one set for wireless companies, and you know, satellite companies, et cetera. Everybody was siloed. But now we have all of these companies competing against each other. And one of the things we often hear is, well, you know, this segment you guys regulate this way, but we, uh, we don't get the same favorable treatment. One of my goals has been to establish as much regulatory parity as possible, because frankly, as a commissioner, I don't care what technology you want to use. I want you to have a maximum incentive to deploy that technology to provide broadband to all Americans. And so that's a matter of, you know, it's, it's difficult because the statute in some cases is 80 years old or 81 years old. We don't have the discretion uh, to establish that kind of parity, but to the extent we can, we want to do it. The second thing is to establish some certainty as to what the rules are. Uh, we're undergoing a fundamental technological transformation in this country, something that I call the Internet Protocol or IP transition. Uh, people are giving up, for example, their copper landlines that were run by the old Montbell, and they're moving to more IP-based technologies like fiber. No one is quite sure how the FCC is going to regulate this great new world of fiber. And so in some cases, they've been holding back on investment or have been telling us, look, we're not going to take the risk, uh, or not as big a risk, if you don't tell us what the rules are going to be. And so that's why in my first major speech as a commissioner, I said, let's create an IP transition task force, identify all of the regulations that apply to this area, figure out which ones remain necessary to benefit consumers and to protect uh, public safety and so forth, and which ones we can leave in the past. And so, for example, one of the votes I took in 2012 was to get rid of some outdated regulations that were first imposed by the FCC's Telegraph Division in 1936. Things like you know, regulating how telephone companies had to issue money orders. To, I just, it, it's insanely old stuff you can't believe is still on the books. And those kinds of regulations are standing in the way of investment. Uh, so I think if we do all these things, you know, make it a level playing field and create certainty, we'll give every company, large and small, the certainty they need, the ability to uh, pull that trigger and make these major investment decisions. Yeah, great question. How do you think? Right, let's over here on the fact that you're, how do you have any thoughts about what the law schools should be doing differently to prepare uh, students for this new world? That is a really good question. Um, in a way, I'm probably the worst person to ask because I'm just, I'm just old. I mean, you can ask my interns now, they will tell you I'm old. They gave me a test recently about millennial pop culture. I had no idea what they were talking about. So I'm so far removed from the law school environment now, I might not have all that much wisdom to share. But what I do know is from my own law school education that the focus was much more on just the cut and dry doctrine as opposed to the practical application of that doctrine. Uh, and I remember thinking uh, when I was in law school like how interesting these different areas of law were. I was trained as an antitrust lawyer, for example, and I found it fascinating. But uh, I never had an occasion to consider the application of antitrust to dynamic regulated industries like the telecom industry. So, for example, um, you know, how do we think about, uh, fly fast forward to now, how do we think about the inception of over-the-top video competitors. Uh, you have new companies coming in seemingly every week trying to provide a new video service that directly competes 
with the big cable companies and satellite and you know, the, the telcos to some extent. They're providing an alternative that never existed before. But as, from an analyst perspective, how should government think about uh, these questions? How do you assess what the competitive impact is? How do you create a framework that protects consumers and competition on one hand, but doesn't frustrate innovation on the other? I don't know if uh, that's something that's incorporated into the curriculum now in your typical antitrust class to look at some of these newer areas, but I think it is really helpful uh, to bring in people, well, not to make a pitch for myself to come to COA more often, it would be great, but I think it's really helpful. I haven't had a chance to visit uh, with some of my friends who are professors, and that's, uh, I think that is what little wisdom I have to share on these issues. I, I think it, it is helpful to hear from people who are in the field who can give you some practical understanding about how they think about these things. It is a real challenge, I can tell you, from someone who spent the better part of his professional life in antitrust to sort out what is the competitive state of the marketplace right now? That's a really difficult question. Um, and uh, the other thing I would emphasize too, to the extent uh, it isn't emphasized already, is just really high quality analysis and writing. Um, I, we see a lot of paper, or at least I do in my role, I'm just bombarded with all kinds of submissions from you know, comments to legal briefs to just standard emails outlining a position. And it's remarkable uh, in a lot of cases how people just leave a lot of questions unanswered, or they don't, uh, they, just their case isn't phrased in as cogent ways it could be. And that's one of the things that uh, I think is really, really important, just cogent analysis and writing is, is absolutely critical. And I'm sure uh, CUA has a program to, to do that, and with any given class you probably do that, but that would be helpful as well. Um, you know, I don't know, I'm sort of dodging around the question, but I can't really think of a silver bullet that uh, would help other than uh, focus on the practical to the extent possible and uh, high quality writing and, and research. Okay. Uh, first of all, I was working with alumni here at Harvard. One question about alumni and alumni are curious about is does the commissioner apply? I mean, if I'm asked, uh, yes, so where the FCC will move to? Oh, you mean in terms of which <laughs> physical locations? <laughs> I wish I knew. Actually, uh, the chairman is going to make that determination. I've heard rumors that it's going to be you know, close to Nats Park, which would be great. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, Brendan, we won't all be skipping out to see baseball games. But, uh, that's the official story. Anyway. Uh, but, no, I'm not sure where we're going to end up. But uh, wherever it is, it cannot be worse than our current location. I still remember, <laughs> I still remember when I started the general counsel's office in July 2007, um, it was coming from Capitol Hill, where you know tons of opportunities to you know, see people, and you just have all these restaurants around, which is a very lively area, to Southwest DC, which at the time, uh, when I started, was the week after the pot bellies had opened, and some of my coworkers were excitedly telling me, there's a pot bellies nearby, you've got to go! And so you see these long lines outside of pot bellies, and people were acting as if it was just a, you know, the, the best thing that had ever happened since the Atari 2600. What I told them was like, look, there's a better world out there. So I'm just hoping that whatever the next neighborhood it is, it's something where you know you leave the building, you don't smell rotting fish coming from the waterfront, which is not the case now. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Stay tuned. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Is there one last question for the Oh, I know. So I certainly hope it's America's team, which, as you know, is the Kansas City Royals. But I fear that the Mets did such a good job last night that, you know, who knew? I've been underestimating them for the entire season. So we'll see how it goes. But this is the 30th anniversary of the Kansas City Royals' last win in 1985. And uh, I never thought I'd see it again in my lifetime. I hope they hope they do one out. <laughs> but by the way, thanks so much again for ta uh, taking the time. I really I can't tell you how much it invigorates me just being able to, to talk to people uh, who are in the space who are just you know, young and innovative and gung-ho. It's really just a shot in the arm for me. And sometimes when I you just push paper all day, but, uh, it's, you sometimes wonder, does anyone else notice or care what we do around here? But you guys uh, really do. Uh, you represent the next generation of communications, law, and technology. And I'm so excited that you've chosen uh, this field in which to uh, make your labors. So, thanks. Thank you. I'm just um, presenting Commissioner Pai with a small token of our appreciation for coming and being here today. It was a great speech. And um, we want to invite everyone to join us in the atrium for a reception. Thank you awesome. for being Thank you. here. This is great. Thanks so much.